Hello, my name's Hugh Morris and I'm director of the RSCM. The Royal School of Church Music is an independent charity whose mission is to nurture and support effective music in worship. We do this by supporting church music and musicians at all ages and stages. The challenges of the last COVID dominated year have made it necessary for us to rethink time and again what we can best be doing to keep the flame of church music burning brightly and we will not give up in this task. We are not fixated on a glorious past, though we build with pride on our 94 years of work so far, we're more concerned with the education work of now and into the future. We have lots of exciting new plans coming to fruition. You can play a part. You might want to sign up to attend one of our webinars, events or courses, or you might want to be involved as a volunteer with our newly relaunching Area Teams Network. To the surprise of many, the RSCM does not receive funding from either the church or the state, and we're grateful for the support of all of those who enable us to carry out our work. You might consider becoming a financial supporter yourself, perhaps as a friend of the RSCM. Whatever it is, we hope you will want to share with us on our journey into the future. We value the chance to connect with you and warmly encourage you to be in touch. Wherever you are and whatever your own circumstance, we hope you will see that the RSCM is there alongside you. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon and welcome to this free lunchtime organ recital with Piers Maxim, Director of Music and Organist at Great Malden Priory, composer and conductor of Elgar Chorale of Worcester. Now, while you're listening to, uh, to Piers on, on the uh, Malden Priory's magnificent pipe organ, built and maintained by Malden-based organ builders Nicholson & Co, do be thinking of any questions you would like me to put to peers on your behalf. You can put them on the chat stream on YouTube or in the comments on Facebook. It would also be lovely to know where members of our audience are. <clears throat> Please also consider donating to the work of the RSCM as it helps organists and all those in involved in church music advance down the road to recovery as guidance changes on music in worship. You can do this easily by visiting the website or by texting RSEM followed by an amount to 70480. <clears throat> now, in case of any technical difficulties, uh, this recital has actually been pre recorded, but Piers will be joining us live when it finishes to answer your questions. And now over to Malvern to hear Piers Maxim.
Hello and welcome to Great Morven Priory, um, where I am giving a recital today on behalf of the RSCM. That was, of course, the most wonderful uh, bit of Rega, the Tartan Fugue in D minor, a great war horse. I'm going to end the programme in about 40 minutes or 35 minutes with another war horse, the great Carrion de Westminster of Louis Vierne. Um, the rest of the programme includes some chorale preludes by Brahms and uh, variations on uh, the same chorale prelude, uh, Herzlich tut mich verlangen by Denis Bedard. I'm also going to play some other works which are published by the RSCM, um, including a lovely piece by Martin Howe, who is uh, 90 this year, his wonderful homage to Elgar. And next I'd like to play a new publication by myself, More Than Sweet Number One.
I'd now like to play for you two pieces by Johannes Brahms. They come from his final opus, number 122, written in 1896, and he died the following year in April 1897. It's fascinating to think that the last of these 11 chorale preludes, Welt ich muss dich lassen, are the final notes that Brahms wrote. I'm going to play numbers 9 and 10, which are both based on the chorale Herzlich tut mich verlangen. In the English-speaking world, we sing the words, O sacred head, so wounded, to this tune. The first of these is uh, very beautiful, of course, with wonderful chromatic inflections around the melody. And the second one has this wonderful pulsating semi-quaver accompaniment.
next I'd like to play for you a piece by Martin Howe, that most wonderful servant of the RSCM, his homage to Elgar, in a way a compliment to my small piece in the uh, More Than Sweet Number One that you heard earlier, but this is a much more extensive piece. It starts with a lovely big tune which comes back at the end. It's marked Maestoso, but it could be Nobilmente. And indeed, there's a very Elgarian spirit to it all with lovely twists and turns and interrupted cadences. I hope you enjoy this. Homage to Elgar by Martin Howe.
So I'd now like to return to the Lenten theme I touched on earlier when I played some chorale preludes by Brahms. I'm now going to play variations on the same chorale, Herzlich tut mich verlangen, by Denis Bedard, who is a French-Canadian organist and composer, born in 1950. Um, the RSCM publish a lot of his music, and in fact I find it very useful. There's, he's written something for most Sundays in the church season. These variations are a set of uh, theme and three variations. Interestingly, they get slower as we progress through to the final one, which is marked by Stozo. Um, and you won't be surprised to know, if you know any of uh, Denis Bedard's music, that there is uh, quite a lot of unexpected harmony. And in this piece, quite a lot of uh, flattened supertonic uh, Neapolitan harmony, which is very fitting for the Lent season.
So I'd like to end the recital now with a great iconic piece, uh, the Carry On to Westminster by Louis Vierne. The story goes that his great friend Henry Willis, the organ builder, hummed the tune of the Westminster chimes to him over the phone. Now either Henry Willis got it wrong or Louis Vierne misheard because he doesn't actually write the correct chimes. But it doesn't matter one bit, it's such an exciting, wonderful piece. I hope you enjoy it.
Wow. Well, Piers, fantastic stuff. Thank you very much for a wonderful recital. Uh, so many of that uh, I'll, I'll take, um, you know, take home with me, although I'm already in home. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the Martin Howe uh, brought a tear to my eye, you know, because oh. uh, uh, you know, I, was, uh, I was at Croydon when uh, we, we recorded an album of Martin Howe's music yes. and uh, the homage to Elgar was featured in that. And, uh, you know, Martin at the organ um, is, is something else, you know, he's sort of this whirling dervish of an organist. Uh, oh, this little, how lovely. A 90 year old man. And it's just sort of yes, uh, really reminiscent. And thank you so much for that. Great, um, absolute pleasure. I enjoyed that so much. Now, uh, uh, we'll, we'll come to questions in a minute, but before we move on to them, uh, I, as many of you know, we are a charity. Um, we don't receive any funding from the state or the church. So do please consider a donation in appreciation of this fantastic recital, either via our website, details of which are on the screen, or by texting. Um, also, a reminder of, that all of today's pieces are available to purchase uh, from our online shop. Just go to rscmshop.com and, and there's a special uh, menu item uh, called Piers Maxim's Organ Recital. Um, in gold, so just click on that and that will take you uh, to uh, where we've listed all the pieces, including Homage to Elgar and Piers' um, uh, wonderful new uh, Malvern Suite. So, uh, Piers, a number of people um, have asked about the Mighty Whirlitzer so you've just been playing. <laughs> yes. Well, let me <laughs> explain a little about it. It doesn't come up from the floor, but uh, it is a wonderful instrument. I mean, we're so blessed to have a, 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 an instrument built originally by John Nicholson. So that's 1850. Right. Um, but we tend to think of it as a Rushworth and Draper from 1927, incorporating pipes from that original organ. Um, in 2004, our local firm, Nicholson's, who are literally down the road, uh, rebuilt it and reordered everything in the chamber. And so, yes, we have this beautiful organ with so many wonderful colors, uh, Victorian choruses to it and uh, orchestral colours as well, a sort of romantic English early 20th century organ. So how much of the of the 1850s uh, remains in, in the organ? It's a good question, I'm not sure, top of my head, um, but there are some beautiful pipes, I suspect it's some of the flues. Um, We've got, for example, flute work on each manual. You'll see the four manuals here, everyone. Um, we've got eight and four foot flutes on each, and that in itself is rather splendid. Mm. And we've got a, a diapason chorus. We've got three diapasons over here and um, lovely tuba. You heard in Martin's beautiful piece there, the, uh, the tuba tune towards the end, um, where he asks for octave and sub-octave. So even though I'm playing one note, of course, it plays a note above and a note below, so you really hear that coming through. I promised my wife I wouldn't talk about wind pressure, but that's on 15 <laughs> inches, <laughs> just so you know. Yes. I think those sort of questions ought to be banned. <laughs> uh, yes, they should. <laughs> At least you haven't gotten off all Clyde, which I suppose. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I mean, you and I have uh, have both uh, learned on, or played on uh, Rushworth and Draper. In fact, we both learned on Rushworth and Draper yes. organs. Um, and uh, certainly the one I learnt on, I think, actually had four open diapasons <laughs> on the grid. Um, have you ever used three open diapasons at the same time? What, what's the point? <laughs> well, no, it is wonderful. You do hear the difference. You wouldn't hear it now because of the miking and things. But um, number three, of, of course, I use the whole time. It's really set up for the quietest uh, combinations. Number two, you really hear the entrance of it. Number, th uh, sorry, number three, number two, number one is the strong one. Um, and actually I don't even use that for the congregation because it is very strong. So um, I use it for very, very special occasions. For final chords, I think the end of the VM, I must have, uh, must have incorporated it there, but it's a very strong sound. Maybe, uh, maybe for the carol service, perhaps you'd need to possibly, yes, so they can hear it right at the back. <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> splendid. Um, now I uh, found your uh, your Malvern Suite really, uh, it's really, really lovely piece of music. Uh, how do you go about composing something like that? Mm, yeah, good question. Of course, with choral works, 
you have the text. I love seeking out texts which sort of inspire me. With uh, instrumental music, there's nothing there. So you sort of, um, I literally almost empty my mind and then just there's that one spark. I always feel I need the intent to compose. I need to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to compose something. And to date, I haven't dried up, and it, it sort of comes, that little spark, that little motif. In this case, I was really thinking of that fourth, da, da, dee, and that is throughout all the pieces, you'll hear that interval of the fourth. The homage to Elgar, though, I thought you might be interested to know, actually came about through a composition lesson. I've taken time out today to be up in the Priory. I should be teaching down the hill in more than St. James Girls School, where I teach composition. And in a composing class there, I sat down, I don't know if you'll hear this, but I sat down and I played to them and you can hear that. Which of course you'll know very well is from Elgar. And I said, when you start composing, you'll have this little motif. That's relatively easy. The difficult part is what do you do next? So I sat down and I just played a little. I said, what would Elgar do with that? And I went, it'd probably just stretch the interval a bit. And from that came, I, I sort of went, mm, remember that? And I wrote it down a few days later and that's how it came about. Mm. That's really interesting. Um... Uh, the, the Martin, you know, we talked talk, talk briefly about the Martin Howe piece. Um, uh, uh, what uh, what drew you to it? To I mean, mm. did you did you know it before we uh, before we planned the recital? Or? I hadn't played it, but I have that lovely tome from the RSM, his collection of works. And actually, some months ago on Facebook, I was watching some a film of Martin playing the organs. Now, was it in Addington Palace? I think it was. He plays all the organs which you had situated around Addington Palace. And he was playing, I think, a piece in memoriam for Gerald Knight. Mm. And I heard this. I thought, oh, that's lovely. And I went, hang on, I've got a, a, a book of his pieces. And indeed, it's in there. And while I was rifling through, I saw Homage to Elgar. And of course, in Malvern, Elgar is in the air. So whenever I see something about Elgar, I sort of latch onto it. And that's what made me think about it really and then you you suggested it i thought perfect to balance with my mm. somewhat lesser piece in the uh, in the Malvern suite yes a nice nice contrast because because uh your your elgar is uh well your homage to elgar is more of the sort of the, the tender elgar rather than the sort of pomp and circumstance uh, i think so uh, i i'd like to think of it almost as um one of the vesper voluntaries which was yeah. sort of lost down the side of the organ in st george's sometime the, uh, the 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 two uh, the Bedar and the Brahms uh, interesting uh, juxtapositions of those isn't mm -hmm. it it's really um, uh, it, what um, how do you feel that the two composers responded to the to, to the chorale in their own different ways yes Brahms of course is writing such a rich romantic language at the end of his life. Um, as I think I said in the introduction there, it's Opus 122, which is literally its finest Opus number. Um, just before Opus 122, you've got 119, which has those beautiful, that first intermezzo, the B minor, dee, 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 do, do, dee, dee, which is just it's out of, you know, you could believe it's 19th century, you sort of imagine it much, much later. Of course, Schoenberg takes on from there, but that's another, that's <laughs> for another time. Um, and Brahms's language is so chromatic, that first one particularly, but the second one is so gorgeous with this just pulsating um, background to the accompaniment. Um, and I find Denis Bedard has done a lovely thing there because, yes, usually his harmonies are very jazzy and warm and slightly blues, and there are moments of that, aren't there, in his uh, uh, in the yeah. Yes, that's right. But then he goes slightly Baroque, doesn't he? Which is beautiful when he does the manuals only, mm. the first theme. Um, and then the third, sorry, the, the first variation, the second variation, I think it is, where you've got the quavers moving. And I just, I'm reminded very much of things like Bach's Erdwandich, of mm. course, yeah, where yeah. you have this pulsating quaver, really beautiful. Yes, and in fact, uh, uh, one of our listeners, uh, John Halsey says, uh, wonders whether it's, uh, um, a homage to BWV 721, which has that sort of same pulse. The chorale, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. It's very much so. 
And uh, are you both, uh, are you going back to your Malvern Street, um, who do you think it would appeal to, 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 to buy and, and to learn it? Let's say everyone, all organists. <laughs> I mean, I tend to, I thought of it originally almost as a liturgical suite. I mean, it's obviously not. We're in the Anglican Church. There isn't such opportunity for offertoire and elevation and things like that. But I've certainly played the first two movements um, as a final voluntary, the introduction and the trumpet tune. Mm -hmm. I played those in Llandaff Cathedral when we were allowed to do things like that. Um, and of course, the final movement is a, is a, a good barnstorming final movement. The homage to Elgar I've played during communion as well because it's nice and gentle. So I would hope most people would enjoy having mm -hmm. a go at it. Yes. And the uh, the Bezar, uh, I, I, I've never actually played it. it uh, what, mm. what sort of level of difficulty would you, would you put that? I would put it at relatively easy when you look at some of Denis's works. They're slightly tricky with finger work. This I would say, we're talking grades, uh, grade four, grade five, certainly. Is, is possible. There's nothing there which is, um, as, as you saw, it gets slower and slower. You've got time to read the notes, and there's nothing which would catch out anyone sort of in the middle of that range. Mm. Well, as I say, a fabulous recital. Thank you so much, Piers. Um, Absolute pleasure. We've, uh, I think everybody has really enjoyed it. And, good. Uh, a, a really good way to spend your lunchtime. Um, We'll be hosting another lunchtime organ recital on Friday the 30th of April, when we will hear from David Halls, Director of Music at Salisbury Cathedral and composer and conductor. Um, and of course, uh, the Salisbury Cathedral Father Willis organ has recently been restored to, uh, to wonderful condition and uh, it'll be a, a fabulous thing to hear. Uh, so in the meantime, perhaps you and your family and friends might like to join, join our fundraising quiz on the 8th of April. You can find all the details by scrolling down on the RSCM homepage at rscm.org.uk and do pa please pass it on. The more we've got, the, the, the merrier. It'll be great fun. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Piers, and thank you all for listening and, uh, and watching. And Hope to see you again um, in on the 30th of April. Goodbye.